There will be a short, I hope, church session meeting on Tuesday night at 7pm. It will be in here and also on Bethany Smith is having an afternoon tea in memory of Robert on Saturday the 8th of October at 3pm. Everyone is welcome to come along. There are bits of paper at both doors. If you intend to come, if you could write your name on the piece of paper, it's not kind of we're going to have a Christmas fair on Saturday the 19th of November. Christmas seems far away, but anyway, we're having a Christmas fair. So donations for the Christmas fair for Trombola and anything else will be taken from next week. There will be boxes at the door if you wish to donate anything. There's also going to be hampers made up, so if you wish to donate anything for Christmas hampers, if you also leave it at the door over the next few weeks. And lastly, it was Maureen and Dave, but where is she? Oh, she's behind Danny. <laughs> <laughs> it was... If we could stand for the final time. service of worship this morning. We always tell you just watch out what you wish for. Last week it was freezing in here. This morning it's melting. It's off. Time for spying. The heating is off, so yes. it'll cool down probably about three o'clock this afternoon. Don't you? Anyway, feel free to take your jackets off. Um, let's still our hearts and our minds before our call to worship. Happy are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the one who made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He is the one who keeps every promise forever, who gives justice to the oppressed and the food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts the burdens of those bent beneath the loads. The Lord loves the righteous. We will praise the Lord as long as we live. So let's begin by praising the Lord in song. Let's sing the opening hymn, hymn number 63, All People That On Earth Do Dwell.
together in prayer, let us pray. The God of salvation, the God who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth, the God who offers forgiveness to each of us through the Redeemer sent in human form, we are grateful that over and over we are given the chance to begin again and that nothing we have done can separate us from God's love. Even though sometimes, God, we take ourselves so seriously. Our opinions, our emotions, our needs, our entitlements, that we fail to notice our effect on others. We do not make connections between our limitless wants and the resources left for others. These things we do, Lord, without even knowing it. Forgive our weakness and teach us again to know the contentment of having enough and sharing, not only from our riches, but also from our poverty. And so in this short time of silence, Lord, listen to the confessions of our heart. Let's now say together the words of our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And we us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We turn now to the Word of God and our first reading this morning comes from the Old Testament, from the book of Psalms. We read Psalm 146. Listen for the Word of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes and human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those who help, whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Our second reading comes from the New Testament. Our Gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels <coughs> carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. 
So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, I remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, <coughs> nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, will they not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead? Amen, and thanks be to God for this, his holy word. Let's sing again. Let's sing hymn number 182. Now thank ye all our God. someone was rich what do you usually think about when I say someone's rich what do, you, what do they normally have everything. everything wow that's really rich <laughs> super rich what, else? What, what, what would they say first off if I said someone was rich what would they have lots of they would usually that's what we usually think yeah so if we if they say someone is, is really rich then normally we think that they have lots of money. But there's actually lots of ways to be rich. I picked on him in quarter, and I'm going to pick on him again now. Look at John here. John sits here and plays the piano and the organ. 
If we think about someone such as John, who is able to play the piano or another musical instrument, then that person is rich in talent. I know someone, my brother-in-law, Anne's brother, who is what we would call the high-tech guy. He's able to answer lots of questions and solve computer problems. Something that we all need most of the time. And he is rich in knowledge of, of electronic things. There are people who are really, really friendly and they're really loving. And they are rich in friendships. There's people who excel at sports. Who's good at sports? Anyone over this side really good at sports? Carol, Carol, you're good at running. Good at watching Sky Sports. <laughs> yeah, well, there's always that. Some of the people are really good at sitting watching BT and Sky Sports. But people who are really, really good at sports, they're, 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 they're rich in their physical strength and endurance. You see, each and every one of us is rich in some way. In one way or another, every single one of us is rich in some way. If you're healthy, you're blessed with good families, have a church to worship in, a job, or retire, or you go to school. The outdoors can be beautiful for you to enjoy. Then you are indeed rich. You see, Jesus teaches us that those who are rich they have an obligation. Do you know what, obli what the word obligation means? No? It means that when Jesus tells us that we are obligated to help someone if we are rich in a talent, it means that he wants us to do it really, really badly. In other words, if you, what are you really good at? <coughs> Dancing? Well, He's probably looking for you as you get older to help someone who's maybe a wee bit younger than you, who's not as good at you at dancing, to help them to learn to be as good as you. Ashley, what are you good at? Riding your bike. Riding your bike. Well, there's lots of people who, when they start off learning to ride a bike, and I remember doing it, they fall off and they hurt themselves. No. Have you ever fallen <laughs> off? No. Wow. Yes. I remember getting right over the handlebars. Wow. So that would mean that Jesus would be looking for you to help someone who's not very good at riding a bike to learn how to be as good as you are because you are rich in the talent of riding your bike. And Ariana, you're rich in the talent of dancing. So we're rich at the talent of everything. But Jesus teaches us that those who are rich have an obligation to help those who are in need. And in need doesn't always mean in need of food or of money. Sometimes it, needs, it means that we are in need to learn something new. So the story that Jesus tells us in the Bible is about a rich man. And it says, and he was clothed in purple and fine linen, living in luxury, every day. This rich man had a lot of food, yet he didn't share what he had with the poor man who lay on the ground just outside of his gate. So for just a wee second, after what I've just said to everyone, can you have a wee think perhaps about how rich you actually are as all? How, how rich are you? And I don't always mean about money. Just think of the things that you can do, we all can do, that we can teach other people who really need to learn how to do things. So if you're rich, like John, in musical talent, would you be willing to share your talent with others who need to hear the music? Oh, John teaches music at school. No doubt he's inspired hundreds, if not more, to 
to come to learn how to play music and love music. If we have musical talent, we can inspire the elderly who are living in nursing homes or even with John, smaller children who can be inspired to learn the things that John can do. If you're rich with computer knowledge, you must be, who else is good with computers, Craig? Switch it on. Switch it on? <laughs> That's the beginning. <laughs> but those who can and do and are good with computers and modern technology, would do, they be willing to teach those who want to learn and become, maybe not brilliant at it, but become confident <laughs> in it? If you know how to be a friend, can you reach out to others? And, they, and, and become friends and show them that the talent that you have, that you are rich in, is friendship. If you're an athletic person, if you can ride your bike or if you can dance, can you find a way to teach someone who can't do that? Can you share your richness with others? Because that is what Jesus asks us to do every single day of your life. If you may think that you can do nothing, we can all do something. We are all rich in something. So let's pray. And it is a... Oh, <laughs> the learning. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this life and all that is in it. Help us to receive your good gifts and then share them with those around us. Thank you and Amen. Thank you. Let's sing our next hymn, hymn number 577, Christ Be Descended. and powerful man. He was selfish and shared nothing. He was out to make money for himself and nothing and no one else mattered. Not even God. God must love me anyway to give me all of this, he would often say. He scared the people less fortunate than himself and he had no time for them and refused to help them. Then one day, he died and went to heaven. He was met at the doors by Abraham who welcomed him in with open arms 
an den Weltkrieg können sich geben. Die Ende. Nun, das ist noch eine Story von der Weimar. Das ist eine faire Story. But I'm, a story I'm sure we will all recognize to some extent in today's society. A society of me. A society that encourages us to strive for more, for bigger and better, to look out for number one, and if that means trampling on the odd person, then so be it. A society where people with vast wealth feel they have the right to say and do whatever they like because they feel they are untouchable. We now even live in a society that thinks a few years ago it was acceptable for someone to use vast wealth to buy their way to being one of the most powerful people on the planet. The Bible story of Lazarus and the rich man could not be more of a contrast to that very story I just began with. Jesus doesn't beat about the bush here. There's no attempt at locating anyone. We get the simple facts, whether we like it or not. If you act as the rich man in the parable, this is what will happen. I spoke earlier to the kids about sharing, not just sharing money, as important as that is, especially in today's society. But sharing in general, sharing time with someone who needs a shoulder to cry on, or a person who just needs an ear to hear them. Sharing your knowledge with young people, or allowing young people to share the knowledge that they have with us. The sharing of ourselves with those around us who may have no one else to turn to is at the heart of the teachings of Jesus. Now, in most societies, including ours, and in the time of Jesus, a story such as the parable Jesus tells us in that story, the rich man would have been the main person. He would have been regarded as the important person here simply because of his wealth. And the poor beggar, well, he would have been completely anonymous, a bit part player in the tale of wealth, an extra. But not with Jesus. With Jesus, the poor beggar has a name. He's the one who is accepted into heaven with open arms, and he's the one who stands by the side of Abraham. And that would have shocked the first hearers of this parable. <clears throat> you can almost hear them saying, after all, what had the rich man done wrong? He made money and he lived well. He probably paid his temple taxes more than the beggar would have done. He may even have employed people. So what did he do wrong? Jesus gives us very little information to begin with in the parable. The rich man and Lazarus don't even speak. We don't even know if they have ever met or even known each other until they both die. It's then, and only then, the rich man with no name uses the poor man's name. And with this, when he asked Lazarus for his help, the last glimpse of hope that we may have had that perhaps the rich man hadn't known that Lazarus was lying outside his gates, it disappears. He knew his name. He knew he'd been there all that time, and he chose to ignore him. He chose to share nothing, not even the scraps from his table. The act of sharing is fundamental to Christians. We share in the bread and the wine at communion, the very thing that is at the heart of our faith. And from that simple act of sharing, 
everything else that we do as Christians, as people of God and as neighbours in our communities, reaches out from that one simple act. We may and often do tell ourselves that we have nothing to share, but we all have something to share, something wonderful. We have ourselves and the love of God and they are more precious than any of the possessions that we could ever have. If we trust in God, we can achieve so much more than that we think that we can. Remember the small boy who gave up his lunch and fed 5,000 people? Jesus asked and he stepped forward. He trusted that through Jesus, God would provide. We only need to look through our history books and wonder at some of the stories of courage and endeavour that people, some would call ordinary people, have actually achieved. But with God, none of us are ordinary people because we are God's children. And as such, God loves and cares for every single one of us. No exception. We don't need to have our names entered into a history book to make an impact or a difference in people's lives. <coughs> we simply need to step outside the walls of the church and engage with our local people, our local communities. I know most of you will remember only a couple of years ago you went as a church into vacancy. And as part of that vacancy, you had to write a parish profile. It was one of the first questions you asked yourselves. Would the community miss this church if it was no longer here? I pray that it was your first question. Because it was the first thing that I looked at when I was looking through the profile. I needed to know that both congregations had the community at the heart of everything that they did. To me, it's important because local people want to go to their swimming classes, their keep fit classes, their lunch clubs, their nearly new clubs. They want to go to they want to go to these clubs locally. They want to go to a place <coughs> where they feel safe and that is welcoming. They want to go to a place that will open its doors to new groups, with new ideas, and they want to come to a building that feels at the very heart of their community. That place is, and should always be, us. We must never become complacent or afraid to share ourselves. We must also accept that not everyone that comes through the doors of our church, for whatever reason, will not come back to worship with us. But one might and to me, that one person makes it all worthwhile. As Christians, we have been sent out by Jesus to spread the gospel message, the good news of salvation. The first step in sharing that good news is in the sharing of ourselves. The second step is to always trust in the Lord. Never doubt God. Never doubt yourself or the message you carry because God does not doubt you. God knows you. God knows your strengths. God knows your weaknesses. At times you may feel overburdened and overwhelmed. But with God by your side, you will never, never be alone. To carry that burden. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our next hymn calls on the courage that we all need. <coughs> hymn number 513, Courage Brother, do not stop.
join together in prayer as we dedicate our offering and we pray for our world, our church and ourselves. Let us pray. Patient God, our ears listen attentively, yet our understanding at times is so lacking. Our eyes look wide open, yet human suffering is squarely in front of us. Our hands stretch outward, yet remain listless. Our voice encourages others, yet remains silent to those in despair. Every day we are faced with opportunities to respond. Forgive us, awaken us, encourage us. Call us again to respond by offering your salvation and your abundant life to others every day. And we humbly place our gifts before you. Lord, your word tells us that there is great good in godliness combined with contentment. That as we brought nothing into this world, so we can take nothing out of it. Help us, dear Lord, to be content with what we have. To seek heavenly treasures rather than those things of this world which rust, corrode and moths consume. Grant that we might be people who share the wealth that you have provided. Father, we especially pray today for those who, like Lazarus, are ignored or neglected and left to suffer in our world. Those who live in poverty within our town and those who lie in great suffering at the gates of our nation. O oh God, bind your people together and make us bright and shining witnesses to your compassion and your grace as they are revealed in the law and the prophets and in Christ Jesus, the one you raised from the dead. Here too we pray the intercessions of our hearts for those who govern and are in authority, for those lost in sin and despair, for those who need healing and for those who seek to serve as Jesus served. And in another brief moment of silence, we especially hold before you today those closest to our hearts. We ask these things and we give you our thanks and praise, our minutes and our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn, hymn number 237. Look forward in faith. <coughs>
the Lord and the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Thank you.